All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Money Talk Tuesday. Today's topic will be planning for parents of children with disabilities presented by the Aries Foundation. My name is Sarah Safi, and I'm a program assistant with the Office of Economic Empowerment. And before we get into the main presentation, I will tell you a little bit more about our office, go over some housekeeping notes, then we'll have the main presentation, and finally, we will end with a Q&A. So the Office of Economic Empowerment is a department within the Office of the Treasurer and Receiver General of Massachusetts, tasked with supporting, advocating, and facilitating policies that empower all Massachusetts residents. Our programs serve women, families, high school students, veterans, and seniors. Our priorities include financial education, closing the race and gender wage gap, racial equity, college affordability, and promoting STEM education. As you may have noticed, this is a webinar and not a meeting, so you won't be able to view any of the other participants. But if you'd like to communicate with myself and the other hosts, you can use the chat function. Um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please use the Q&A function and we will get to your questions at the end. Once the webinar concludes, a brief survey will pop up on your screen. We kindly ask that you fill it out as it will um, help us improve this event. If you would like to attend any future Money Talks, you can follow this link, which will be dropped in the chat. Our next Money Talk will be two weeks from today on October 26th at 12 p.m. If you'd like to explore other financial topics relevant to your life, you can visit myfinanciallifema.org, which is another program that we offer through the Office of Economic Empowerment. And finally, if you have any questions or feedback about this event or any other Money Talks, you can email us at Money talk at tre.state.ma.us. And that is all for me. I will now turn it over to the Aries Foundation. Tom and Craig, whenever you're ready, you can introduce yourselves and get started with your presentation. Tremendous. Thank you, Sarah. And we certainly are excited to be here. I'm just going to get this set up real quick. So hopefully everybody can see that. There we go. Um, okay, so we're going to do what we call a different hand to play. This is really a sort of an overview step by step guideline for parents of a child who is either differently abled or has a disability. Um, I'm going to go through some of this real quick because we don't have a lot of time. So um, just understand that if you do have any questions, as Sarah say, if you can drop them into the chat box. And if time allows, we will add and get to them as the presentation when the Q&A pops up. But if you're just thinking of it, just drop it into the chat box at that time. I'm not gonna touch on Craig and I because we'll come back to this in a second. Uh, real quick, we'll, we'll do a brief introduction to who we are, what we do. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of the expenses to be thinking about and looking at. Our government benefits, going through them, again, real high level with that talk about supplemental needs trusts and ABLE accounts, 529A ABLE accounts and how they work. And then we'll talk about some of the assets and funding and what can you do and how do you do that and going through it. So real quick, as Sarah said, we are the Aries Foundation for Financial Education. My name is Tom Alessi. I am the president of Aries. I have been, I'm actually been in finance, I'm in my 23rd year in financial services. Uh, I am an investment advisor, it means that I act in a fiduciary capacity whenever I'm giving guidance or advice to any of my clients. I'm going to bring my vice president. Craig, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Craig Richardson. I'm the vice president of the Aries Foundation. Uh, I've been in the financial services industry a little over 17 years now, and I specialize in doing financial planning for families and small businesses so they can have a brighter future with their money. Tremendous. And Craig will be chiming in as we go along through this presentation. But real quick on the Aries Foundation for Financial Education, you can visit us at www.ariesfoundation.org. We're a nonprofit. Our mission is really trying to help everyone have a better relationship with their money. Part of what Craig and I also do, however, is the Special Needs Resource Network. And the Special Needs Resource Network really is meant to be that. It's meant to be a support for a family with a child who is differently abled or has a disability. 
the mission, our goal with the special needs resource is trying to connect with as many organizations, advocates, and other professionals so we can answer those questions and be the resource for those families. Getting into the presentation in terms of what we were talking about, you know, raising any child is a complex thing, right? You're dealing with a lot of emotions and there's a lot of different experiences go on. But when that child has a disability, it brings a lot more into the conversation. And one of the things that we found is that, that a lot of times parents tend to get tunnel vision, start to feel like that it's only happening to them. And while everybody's journey is unique, you know, realize and understand that that's not the case, that you are not alone in dealing with this. You know, the screen says 20% of Americans are disabled. As of 2021, that actual number is more like 26 percent. And when we talk about a child with special needs, that number is, it's over 11 million. That's like one in five households are actually caring for a child who has a disability now. So you are definitely not alone. Sure. And one, of, one of the good things that comes from that is that due to a lot of the medical advances and the healthcare industry and the way things are, that a lot of those disabilities are now life-threatening. What you have is more and more children outliving their parents, which is a wonderful thing. The problem is, and what we'll talk about with some of this is the concern of dealing with those future expenses for that child when they are an adult and you are no longer around and able to help them or care for them. You know, and when we look at those you know, long-term costs on that. You know, you can see the screen says, hey, the, the a child with autism ends up, lifetime expenses ends up being somewhere around a million and a half dollars. When we add in an intellectual disability, you're talking about two and a half million, which versus a typical child is about 250,000. So the, the overwhelming cost, the expense is there and needs to be looked at and thought, how am I going to help or prepare for that, because whatever the circumstances, there are resources available to help with that fundamental, well, how am I gonna deal with this? Or how am I, is my child when they're an adult going to be able to deal with this? Tom, we, we need to stop for one second. We got a little housekeeping here to do with the uh, interpreter. Okay. Sarah's gonna make, tell us about that. Yes, sorry to cut you off, Tom. Just wanted to mention that we have an ASL sure. interpreter with us today um, and I will, and spotlight their video just so that it's easier for everyone. Let me. Do you need me to stop my share? Yes, and then if you could reshare, that would be great. Yeah, we don't know. You know, you, you, you stop the machine there. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. That's crazy, right? <laughs> you know, look, I'm supposed to pick back up. Um, now share your screen. Let's see how this works. You just want to see his jokes interpreted. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Could you reshare, Tom? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, hopefully that picked up right where I left off. I will move on. So when we talk about those expenses, right? So one of the things I want you to think about when we talk about expenses is that you're going to see a lot of these are, if you're dealing with a child, the things that you're, you're, you're having to pay for and deal with today, right? So okay. other thought with this and the other conversation is that some of these expenses will carry on for your child when they are an adult. Specifically, there may be transportation needs, you know, a caregiver, therapy, medical co-pays, medical equipment, that's durable equipment stuff, assisted technologies. Like a lot of those are expenses that you may be helping with or covering today, but possibly and will probably be a need for your child as an adult into the future. The top one in the bottom, right? So private school is like every other child, probably once they become an adult and they, they've aged through the system and done whatever additional after, you know, uh, elementary education that they need, they're done. The one on the bottom there, we talk about lost earnings, and that's really for 
parents because what we've usually found is that one parent will end up being more of the caregiver or the provider for a child and end up uh, getting taken out of the workforce. Craig, right? Wouldn't that be the example that we run into? Yeah, very often that is the case. Um, just because you know child care is expensive for a typical child, it's um, you know very difficult when you're dealing with a child with special needs. Right, and so that's just again another consideration and something to be thinking about in terms of dealing with everything. You know, so what can you do? Well, you have government benefits, and we're going to talk about this at a very high level with the government benefits. At the end, we're going to meet you. We're going to tell you with the resources available. You know, we do this what's called a roadmap to government benefits, where we go a little bit deeper and how you can get a hold of that and talk about each of these and some other uh, government resources that are available. The first one is Medicaid, right? So Medicaid, federally funded program. The one thing to understand with Medicaid is that it is means tested. It means that the individual, that's your child, can only have a certain amount of money. If they have more than that amount of money, they will be disqualified from, you know, from the benefit. They're only allowed a certain amount of money. It's $2,000 per individual, and they can only earn a certain amount of money that if they go over that amount, they are now no longer qualified for the benefit. That's the biggest thing to understand with Medicaid. Supplemental, the SSI, Supplemental Security Income, this is basic resources, food and housing, right? Same concept though, these are means tested benefits, which means that if the child has too much money, more than $2,000 in their name, they are not gonna be qualified for these benefits. SSDI, which is what everybody probably is used to and understands, right, is for disability, not means tested, but you do have to qualify. And your child may be receiving benefits. We'll talk about this when we get to guardianship and a timeline on things. But once they become an adult, they have to re-qualify for the benefit. But these are all benefits that are put there. They're to thought of as, hey, these are a safety net. It's like a base that is available. The question becomes, you know, just like for you, dealing with your own, when Craig and I go through with retirement planning with people, right? You're trying to plot out into the future, how much am I gonna need? How much am I gonna be have to access for the need that I have? Now you have to do the same thing for your child. Because if your child is going to live out into the future as an adult, there's going to come a time when you are not gonna be there and they are gonna be on their own. And you have to sort of do the same assessment. How much am I gonna need or are they gonna need how much am I going to be able to set aside where they're going to then have that additional monies for that income going out into the future? And that's really the conversation. The government benefits are a good base. That's a safety net to start. But a lot of times there needs to be additional monies on top of that. All right. So the first document we usually talk to people about when we get into sort of legal document portion is a letter of intent. And I'm going to turn that over to Craig to sort of go through the letter of intent. Great. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, a letter of intent, while it's not a legal document, uh, it can be a critical document when, if something should happen to you and the courts are need, needing to make decisions uh, about what to do next with your child. The other thing it, it does, it's kind of like a love letter that lets other people know a lot of information about your child. So we're talking about what their daily routines are like, um, what the, what, who their friends are, what their social life is like, you know, their favorite recreational activities, their, and, and most importantly, you know, their health history, the health concerns or medications, if they have a special diet that they're on. And then, you know, the people who are helping that child uh, and supporting that child, like their case managers and their doctors and their dentists, um, and even their favorite barber. <laughs> so because if you're not there, you need something to speak for that child. And a lot of people say this is kind of like, you know, in addition with a will, which we'll talk about later. But, you know, this could be, you know, you decide you need some respite and you decided to go for a vacation and leave your child with a relative. Well, it's great that your relative has this information because it tells you, you know, what are the things that, you know, may help your child to calm down in a stressful situation or what are triggers that may, you know, you know set your child off um, that would make some more difficult for them. Uh, and this is also, you know, talks about the legal and financial information as well. Uh, so if you're not around to know, and Tom will get into this as well, you know, is there a trust set up? Is there a will? What are the legal, you know, who would be the preferred guardian? Those types of things. 
and the, this letter should be updated on a constant basis. I'd say we we think Tom like once a year. Yeah, uh, it absolutely should be a, a once a year thing. Probably start sometime around like age 10, 11, mm -hmm. and then update it because everybody changes. Like you know, what you like today isn't necessarily something that you're going to like five years from now. Absolutely, and your doctors may change, your medications may change, your friends may change all of those things. And it's also, you know, document your hopes and dreams for your child as well. You know, what do you want to see them aspire to? What are the goals you want, they, they want to aspire to? Um, so it's basically, you know, speaking for you, giving as much information about your child, almost like you wish you had when they were born, kind of like a, you know, instruction manual. <laughs> right. Absolutely. It's a great point in terms of that, in terms of how you want to have that set up and to do that on a regular basis. And then, from here, we go into supplemental needs trusts, otherwise known as special needs trusts. And there's really two different types of trusts. You have a first party trust and a third party trust. We'll go into a little deeper dive with some of it, not, not very deep, because we, again, we don't have much time in terms of going through that. But just understand a first party trust is set up by your child and they are funding it. A third party trust is basically anybody else is setting it up and funding it, which is why the third party trust is the most common type of supplemental needs trust, because generally it's parents or grandparents or somebody else setting up the trust on behalf of the child or an adult at that point, and then funding it in any way that they can. So the money is available to the beneficiary of the trust, that would be your child, right? Any money that's in there and that's used for the benefit of the child, no disqualification from any of those benefits that we talked about, the government benefits. So the idea there is you're able to park money aside, benefit the child, and now Medicaid, SSI, those are not affected in any way, right? You create the trust or whoever, you know, you, your, your, your parents, right, the grandparents of the child, whoever it is. And you can fund it now, or you can fund it in the future. You can make the decision once it's set up, I've got assets I wanna put aside now for the child's benefit, or I can wait till I've passed and then pass them through my will. And we'll talk about that when we get into the will, but anybody can contribute to it. It's not limited to just who set it up. So if there's you know, grandparents who wanna gift money or leave an inheritance or do something like that, they can do it through the special needs trust. And you can fund it with any assets. You can fund it with life insurance. We'll talk about some of that funding stuff in a little bit and going through it. But just understand, this is pretty much the most flexible of the arrangements. And the reason for that is that, you know, the distributions are pretty much, there's a trustee who oversees the third party trust and they're responsible for determining whatever the child needs. Right, so it's not limited to what the child can get or what the child can use. Um, we'll get into it a little bit with the first party trust about the limitations that are there. So, you know, it's basically just allowing you to have the, to facilitate anything that the child, now an adult, may need for their benefit through the third party trust. You know, and one of the things with a first party trust, and we'll get into it when we talk about ABLE, is there are what is known as a Medicaid payback provision, which says that, hey, if, if their child passes and there are assets still left in the trust, Medicaid can step in and ask to be repaid for the benefits that were paid out. In the case of a third party trust that does not exist, it means you name a contingent beneficiary. So if there were siblings, you name a contingent, you name a sibling as a contingent beneficiary to this third party trust. Or you could name a charity or somebody else. If the child, now an adult, passes and there's money still in the trust, then that just passes to whoever named as a contingent beneficiary. There is no clawback or take back provision. Right? So, that's, like I said, with the first party trust, there is a clawback provision. We'll talk about that in a second. Right, so what's the, you know, really the biggest hurdle is probably cost to get it set up, right? Craig, what would you say the average in this area is the 
to set up a, a supplemental needs trust? Uh, most of the attorneys I talk to in this area, and it does vary anywhere from maybe $3,500 to $5,000. Right. Right. So, so you're talking somewhere in that, that, that say, call it four to $5,000 range to set the supplemental needs trust up. That becomes a lot for a lot of parents to try to get over that hurdle and try to figure that out. So that's the first stumbling block. Cost is a factor. The other is funding. A lot of times, some of them have a minimum funding amount. So that you've got to actually, you can't be just, you know, throwing in a thousand dollars here or a thousand dollars there. Some of them have a, you know, a, a starting point of a minimum of say 20 or 25,000 to start funding that vehicle. So everybody's different. Everything is different, but you just want to be aware of that, that there is some of that component to setting up that third party trust. So what about the other trust, the first party trust? Like I said, the first party trust, now this is your child, whether they're a child or an adult, they're the ones who are setting the trust up. They're the one who are funding it. You may say, well, how are they funding it? Where do they get money? Well, in some cases, it may have been, they may have been in an accident and awarded uh, 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 money from that, uh, medical malpractice, you know, some suit like that. In some cases, unfortunately, they inherit money. And that money now is disqualifying them from benefits. So you need to have something that now I've got to set up this first party trust so I can take care of this inheritance and get it out of their name. The other two that are there, the pool trust and a, and a state ARC master trust, these are, these are similar arrangements. Um, they can be first party or third party. The pool trust is, is just means that the, when the money comes in, when it's being managed, it's managed under a pooled arrangement. They're separate accounts. The money's never commingled, but it's run in such a way where it's, it's, it becomes a little bit more efficient in terms of dealing with it. It's definitely more cost effective because the cost to set up a, a pool trust is you know, like a couple hundred dollars. It's like five hundred dollars to a thousand versus the four or five thousand to set up a third party trust. However, just like the first party trust, a pool trust does have the Medicaid clawback provision. So Medicaid could step in and say, wait, I, I'm going to access this. But if you're doing it right and funding this out efficiently in terms of the plan, it shouldn't really be a, a factor in, in dissuading you from having the conversation or opening some form of a supplemental needs trust to benefit your child. So Craig, I'm going to ask you, can we do this without a trust? Absolutely, you can. You don't need to have a trust. <laughs> uh, the problem becomes is what do you, how do you handle it? So if you distribute the assets directly to your special needs child, it's going to be like Tom said previously a few times. If they have too many assets, it's going to disqualify them from the medical benefits and social security eligibility. That's probably not the most desired outcome. The other thing you can do is you can disinherit your child, right? That means they're not going to receive any of the money. Well, they'll still get their government benefits. None of the funds that you left behind go to benefit them. Um, the, the common thing I hear a lot is I'll just leave the money to another family member, a sister, a brother, an uncle, an aunt. Um, and that comes with a lot of good intentions, but the issue becomes if they should get into trouble or they got divorced or they passed away before your child, then all of a sudden the money you meant to help that your, your child isn't there anymore. And then the third way is just don't plan, right? <laughs> um, just keep your child's assets low enough to retain government benefits. And, you know, it doesn't provide any, you know, you could accidentally have them inherit it and you didn't mean to, and that knocks them off of benefits. So you, not planning is a plan, but not the best plan. Right. And it, it worked. that's the same for everybody, right? We always say, you know, uh, failing to plan is planning to fail, right? Not having a plan is a plan, but it doesn't work ultimately. And right. so, you know, it, when Craig talks about assets and, and, the, and the deal with, with, you know, trying to fund using assets, right? So just realize not all the assets that you have are created equal when we're talking about putting them into a supplemental needs trust. The first one is retirement accounts. Great. Everybody ha probably has a 401k or some sort of a retirement account. And the thought is, well, I'm just going to, once the supplemental needs trust gets set up, name that as the beneficiary. I pass, then whatever's left from there is gonna go into the account. Great, it's certainly a way to do it. Couple of things with that. The first is 
If you're going to do that, you need to make sure you have the right special needs trust set up because you don't want it to be having to distribute those are required minimum distributions. Granted, the SECURE Act put the provision in place that anyone with a disability does not have to distribute in the 10 year, the new rule. It can be lifetime, so that's fine. But if the distribution, that required minimum distribution goes over the $2,000 limit, now suddenly they're disqualified from benefits. The other is with a retirement account is that you, you you know, you're supposed to be using it for your retirement. Granted, you pass early, then that's fine and going through that. But what if you live a long time and you've now liquidated all of the funds inside your retirement account and you did what you wanted to do, which is you lived and used your retirement account, but it's not there anymore. A house, we hear this a lot, Craig and I, when, and, you know, I want to leave the house to my child so that they can live there, which is great. Always a good thing. And it's wonderful if you can do it. The issue becomes... Are there other components to this, i.e., is there still a mortgage? What about real estate taxes, utility bills, upkeep, all those things? Is this something that the child is going to be able to take on and deal with? I have to have a trustee who's going to then deal with it. And are there funds set aside that are going to be able to handle that portion of it? Because one problem with having real estate is if the equity is all the money's in the property. And if all the money's in the property, then more than likely the, your child is not going to be eligible to qualify. The only way to get it out is to take a loan to then get the money out of that property. So great thought and, and certainly something that can be done and can be looked at, but there are some unforeseen consequences there that you really need to be considering and thinking about when, when setting real estate into a supplemental needs trust. And the last one is securities. Securities, again, another very good tool for this. The problem is there are all these contingent things that go along with it, just like you know, we make the illusion and talk about the, the, the tie to retirement a lot, but it's a similar conversation. You get to retirement, you're going to start taking this money out to live on, which is assuming what would happen with your adult child once you're gone. Well, if the market downturns, Who's making the decisions on how they're dealing with it? And more than likely, if you're still pulling money out while the downturn occurs, you're not going to ever get it back. And is the child going to be aware enough or be able to handle that and or the trustee? And if the trustee isn't, then now they're relying on another party. And Craig will talk about this at the end in terms of building out a team where you really need to have a lot of pieces moving because there's a lot that can happen there. So again, great idea and certainly can be done, but it's something that has to be looked at as to how safe and efficient it's going to be when we're talking about trying to be there for the lifetime of your child as an adult. And one of the ways we can do that, and I'll bring Craig back in. Oh, sorry, you're bringing me back in. Yes. <laughs> that was like you. Uh, yeah, so as Tom has said, you know, a lot of people try to fund a trust with what we call remainder assets. Right, the assets that are left when you're no longer living. And the problem with that is twofold. Number one, you don't know how long you're going to live, right? So you don't know if you're going to be here tomorrow or 50 years from now. Uh, the second is if you are fortunate enough to live a long life in retirement, you may not have as robust a retirement because you're trying to leave assets for that child. Another way to solve this problem we have found is with life insurance. Um, life insurance allows you to, to decide, you know, how much will our child need between now and, you know, the rest of their life for, for funds if I should pass away tomorrow or if I should pass away 50 years from now. It allows you to carve that out on what you can afford uh, based on your family's budget. And now you have the trust funded separately from the rest of your assets. Um, and you can do that in a way that makes sense because every family is a little bit different and the way you fund that would be a little bit different. Um, so the life insurance, um, like I said, can be effective because you can do it for small minimum payments, kind of like when you're putting away your 401k plan, you're not funding retirement all at once, you're doing it over a long period of time. You can do the same thing with life insurance. Uh, money is Im immediately available if you did pass away. Uh, so unlike retirement, where you have to save up for a long period of time, if you had life insurance, that you know, as soon as you passed away, all the death benefits available for that child and can be set up into that trust. Um, and it's also available after the very first premium. So, I mean, if you made one premium payment and passed away, the entire thing would be paid, the entire death benefit. 
Um, so once again, it's, it's, a, it's a very way, good way to leverage and help your child. And you can name the trust as a beneficiary, which is really the important part, because now you won't uh, disclude your child from government benefits. Absolutely, terrific. So we do wanna ask a quick poll question uh, for the audience. Have you heard of an ABLE 529 account? If you could just take a minute and just answer that, yes or no. It popped up and it told me I can't vote. Yeah, because we're on the panel, we can't vote. <laughs> we have no vote. <laughs> I'm hoping my answer is yes. I've heard of this if we're talking about it. <laughs> so you can pull that down whenever you're ready. Terrific, thank you. So uh, real quick with, with ABLE accounts. Um, so this is Achieving Better Life Experience. That's what ABLE stands for. Um, high level overview, again, real quick. We don't have a lot of time to do a deep dive into ABLE. But ABLE didn't come into fruition until 2014. Actually didn't put the first ABLE account on the books until 2016. And at that time, you had to live in the state that adopted the ABLE account. And at that point, there were only six states. So it was very, very limited. Thanks to some legislation and some, some uh, updates to, to some of the provisions, in 2017, that changed. So what they were able to do is to say, wait, that doesn't make sense. You can now, it does not matter where you live. You can open an ABLE account, just like a regular, what I call a traditional 529 college savings plan. ABLE works the same way. Don't have to live in the state to do that. However, there are some variations to this. You know, it's fairly easy. Most of the applications are all done online. If your child is not able to do it themselves, you can be appointed or someone else can be appointed to open the account on their behalf. Like we talked about this whole thing with means testing, any money that is in an ABLE account, the 529A does not count against Medicaid or SSI. If the funds are then pulled out and used to benefit the child, there's never a tax consequence on any of the money. Right now, however, the rule is the disability had to have been diagnosed prior to age 26. I can tell you right now, there is legislation and they, it's coming up for vote, I believe sometime either this year or the beginning of next year, they're going to move this to 46. Um, specifically for those who experience vision loss or in you know uh, dealing with any vision impairment, know that a lot of times that comes later in life. So moving to 46 is a great thing. The limit is $100,000. That is the maximum that can be in the account. The minute the, the account goes over $100,000, you now trip the Medicaid and SSI wire and says now you're no longer, you're, you're, you're disqualified for benefits. If you get to that point and you have 95,000 sitting in the account, spend some of the money is ultimately what it comes down <laughs> to. Keep it below the 100,000. And as we have talked about, there is a Medicaid payback provision on this. So if the child passes and there's money in the ABLE account, Medicaid will step in and say, hey, we have some, some funds that we would like to recover as part of this. Hey, Tom, just in the interest of time, I'll swan layoffs 12.36. Thank you. Uh, so who can contribute? Pretty much anybody, once the account is established, anybody can contribute. That means parents, grandparents, siblings, friends, relatives, anybody can contribute to this thing. You are limited to the gift task, gift tax provision, right? So how much can be gifted on an annual basis by one person? That means $15,000, one account only per individual, and the maximum that can be put inside that per year is $15,000. However, if you have a child who's high on the autism spectrum, say, or, you know, doing some sort of uh, work or co-op uh, type of work, and they're getting paid, they can also contribute. To, it, to the ABLE account. It can be used for just about any expenses you can think of. We talked about this thing with housing where, where one drawback to a special needs trust is that, that if funds are used to supplement housing costs, it disqualifies the housing benefit. What you can do is you can use the money in an ABLE to pay for those housing benefits because it's pretty much any qualified disability expense. You don't have to live in this state, we already talked about that. 
And one of the, the, the weird little things in here is that if you happen to have funded in or are funding into a traditional college savings plan, a regular 529, you can move the funds from a traditional 529 plan to an ABLE account on an annual basis where there's no penalty. There's no any implications for that. You're just limited to that 15,000 tax gift tax rule. You can only move 15,000 a year. But so you can open a 529 for your child if they end up not deciding to go to post-secondary education, then you can move the funds over to the ABLE and they can use those funds on their behalf. So very effective tool in terms of, of you know, having money and being able to put money aside for an individual. Craig, I'm gonna turn this over to you for a will. Yeah, sure. So a will, you know, that's something we ask every client that we work with, do you have a will? Because everybody should have one. It's the last uh, thing that speaks for you if you can't speak for yourself. It's especially important if you have a family and children, and especially even more important if you have children with special needs. Um, because whatever goes, if the, if the parents have to, if you pass away and they go to court and they have to decide who's going to get your child, this is the only document that's going to tell them what your wishes are. Um, and you don't want a family court just making a decision in 15 minutes who's going to spend, you know, your child's going to spend the rest of their life with without any guidance. So very, very important to have a will done. Yeah, absolutely. And just, just, you know, sorry about that. You know, have you done a will for yourself? I knew there was another poll question to pop up, Sarah. Apologize for that. So just real quick, have you done a will for yourself? And, you know, one of the reasons for asking the question on that, as Craig said, is because this is sort of that, that, that backbone of the whole thing of, of dictating where things go. But as Craig mentioned early on, the letter of intent usually goes with this. You know, because one of the things with the will is that not every asset passes by a will. You have, and if you take nothing else away from today, other than you should have a will and get one, right? But is that you should do a beneficiary review for anything that you have named a beneficiary for, whether that's a retirement account at work, benefits at work, a life insurance policy, whether your own IRA, annuity, savings bonds, et cetera. You can see the list there. Because if you name someone else, you should then have a contingent beneficiary, and I'm going to you turn it over to Craig in a second to talk about this, to back it up so that the assets don't accidentally pass to your child and then trigger the disqualification of benefits. Craig, why don't you take it away with dividing the assets up? Right. So um, if you have one child, it becomes fairly simple. Right. Um, everything's either going to move to your child's name or it's going to move to a trust, depending on your situation. If you have multiple children, um, you can have children with special needs and also typical children. You know, then you're going to have a trust that's going to have a special needs provision inside it. And you can divide those assets based on what you think your children's needs are going to be. You know, some people think everything should be equal. And that's their personal decision. Or it could be based on, you know, what each each child should get based on your on the need. So fair isn't always equal. <laughs> um, uh, the next thing is, as Tom said, is make sure that you have a contingent beneficiary. Um, the primary beneficiary may be the trust, but it could also be another child um, or another person who may pass away or may not be able to receive benefits. Maybe they become disabled and can no longer receive the, the, the benefit. Um, so you want to have a contingent beneficiary because you don't want those benefits to pass to your child unintentionally and push them off of their government benefits. Once again, you want the money to benefit them in the best way possible. And that comes to also redirecting gifts from family and friends. I mean, a family and our friends, they always have the best wishes and they always want to help. Um, but you have to control the assets and how they come in to your child. Otherwise, what happens is, when we go to the next screen, Gifts from the family and friends can have an unintended consequence of disqualifying your child from benefits. You know, grandma decided she wanted to leave some money to every one of the grandchildren, but didn't think about little Johnny who can't because he's getting benefits. Uh, and now all of a sudden you, you cause a problem and you have to disinherit or move the money to a first party trust. So communication goes a long way. It's really about making sure your family understands the best way to help because they do want to. And that's about communication and conversation. Absolutely. And, and I'm going to talk about guardianship real quick here on this. 
you know, and guardianship is really twofold. There's, there's sort of two thoughts to guardianship. I'm gonna read Michael's quote here real quick. The guardianship is the only way I can make sure that his mom or I will be able to advocate for what is necessary so he will be safe and happy. To secure this, I must prove to a court that my son is incapable of making decisions on his own. My wife and I must also choose someone to accept the responsibility when we are no longer alive and, and who we can trust to carry out our wishes. I think that sums up the idea of guardianship for an adult child tremendously. Like it just, it just capsulizes the whole thing, you know, because when we talk about guardianship, a lot of times, most of us think of guardianship for a minor child, right? My child is, is a minor, something happens to me, I've got to name somebody who's going to take over for them. Absolutely, that is the case. And this talks about it where, you know, you got to be thinking that. And when it's a typical child, that's a lot to deal with. But now when we're talking about a child who's differently abled or has a disability, more gets involved. And so you want to bring the people into the conversation. You want to make sure you're picking the right person. You want to make sure that they're comfortable, that they understand it and to do it. And really to possibly, if you can, include the child in the conversation or to at least have them have that understanding of what would happen in that case. You know, that's for the minor child when we're dealing with that. Uh, we've got a timeline here that we deal with. You know, this talks about share the difficulties and rewards of going through that and spend time together. But this guideline really is talking about now guardianship when the child becomes an adult, right? So this timeline goes through a lot. So it says 13 on the screen, 13, 14. That's where the planning that future funding conversation, that's where you should start building that outline. How are we gonna have the money available? Where is it gonna be? How much is the need gonna be? Start building that out. This says as of age 16 that I should be, uh, you know, sort of looking at post-secondary concerns and, and information. But at 17, I should be in the conversation about whether or not my child is capable of handling things themselves and do I need to take on the responsibility of guardianship? Well, this is a COVID world. Between quarantine and COVID, that conversation has been pushed back. That conversation should now be taking place probably at 16 and a half is when this process should be started. Because Craig, what's it talk? Nine to 10 months now, right? In terms of winging its way through the court system? Oh, easily. I heard people starting at 16 to try to get it done now. Right, because the conversation is you need to have that guardianship paperwork done before the child becomes an adult, turns 18, because once they're an adult at 18, it's a much more difficult process that you have to go through to obtain guardianship. So it's probably 16, as Craig said, is a better time to make that decision, certainly by 16 and a half to start the process, the paperwork and all that you need to go through because it's going to take a while to get through the system. 18, they become an adult. If they were on benefits prior, this says by 19, you've got to requalify for any SSDI, any Medicaid, anything like that, you've got to requalify for benefits. 18 to 22, this is when they're in the, the post-secondary where vocational training through the school system, they haven't aged out yet. They don't age out until 22, but then, healthcare, they can stay on your health plan just like a typical child until age 26. But by that time, after age 26, now they're on what would be Medicaid, that would be Mass Health here in Massachusetts. So all of these are considerations that you need to be thinking about as the child is aging, what do I have to do and how am I going to make that happen? And this is why I bring Craig back in where we talk about that whole putting a team together thing. Well, I think it's just like when you do it in a medical professional, you have your, your general practitioner and then you go to specialists for the different different needs you have. It's the same thing when you put in together a financial team. You, know, you have your financial advisor, professional who's you know trying to answer all your general questions and, and get you guided down the, tr the funding road. But to put a trust in place, to, to handle your taxes, you need the attorney, you need the accountant, you need the other professionals so you, know, you can have a rounded out team and you know you're handling everything the right way. Absolutely. You know, real so real quick, just to wrap this up, right? So remember, you're not alone, right? Consider what those expenses are that you're paying now that are more than likely going to go with your child out into the future. 
think about how you're going to fund that. Is it going to be a supplemental needs trust? Is it going to be an ABLE account? Is it going to be a combination of the two, right? Realize like Craig talked about, leveraging life insurance is one of the most efficient ways to make sure I know the money is going to be there regardless of when I pass, it's going to be able to fund that trust and going through it. So this is Craig and I in our more formal attire for anybody who ever sees us out there, you know, in, in the community, we're, we're out and about, we're usually at a conference or training or something. Yes, those are Tom Brady jerseys, they're custom to us. We still wear the TB12, so let's face it, he's still playing and he's the GOAT and you can't find Mac Jones jerseys right now. So we're a little bit tight on that, but our contact information should be dropped in the chat box so that if you ever have any questions or concerns, you can reach out to us. You know, one of the things that we do make available to everybody is a complimentary meeting. We, we if you got questions or concerns, you know, this went very quickly. Just if you wanna just, hey, look, I got some questions. Can I go over that with you? That's why we're here. But I mentioned a couple of the other resources that we make available. One is the roadmap to government benefits, that roadmap to government benefits that touches a little deeper into each of those government programs that are available. And also we have a guidebook that's sort of a step-by-step -step checklist that goes along with this. We understand everybody's on a journey, right? It's you're just somewhere along the path, but everybody's on a very, very similar journey in terms of what's happening. This is sort of that guideline to sort of help you get through that. And really all you got to do is if you, you know, want to get a hold of this or you know, you take us up on that complimentary consultation, you can drop yes into the chat box because we're happy to reach out. We're happy to send out the material to you, give you something to go through and sort of get an overview on. And with that, I think I'm done, Sarah. So I don't know if there are questions in the chat box or questions for us at this point. Yeah, there were a few questions. Um, one of them is, can ABLE accounts be held within a special needs trust? So no, that you would not do that because they're both non-disqualifying assets. And one of the things, and I mentioned it briefly there, it's, it's a unique thing that uh, housing is just one of those weird things. Like if you take money out of a supplemental needs trust and use it to supplement or offset pay for housing, you can actually possibly disqualify the child from receiving housing benefits. But an ABLE account allows you to pay for the housing just because it's a qualifying uh, qualified disability expense. So what you can do is you can take money out of the special needs trust, transfer it to your ABLE account, and then use the ABLE account to pay for certain expenses. So it's almost like a hand in hand thing but the only way you can set up an ABLE account is through the individual. Your son or your daughter, your child is the only person who can open it. You can't open it. Nobody else can open it. It's an individually owned account. Great, thank you. And then a few other questions. Um, how can low income families utilize these programs or options? So they, again, you've got to qualify. You know, it's, it's applying and qualifying, know what's available. Um, and accessing them. And there's a lot of different organizations out there that can help with that and go through it. Like I said, one of the first places I would start is with that roadmap to government benefits that we mentioned mm -hmm. as, a, as a reach out, as a way to go through that. But there are a lot of programs out there and a lot that are available. Yeah, you also wanna to go to DSS um, and get started there. Um, and there's a lot of information. Like I said, we, we, the reason Tom and I put this information together is to be a connector. Because there are so many foundations, there's so many organizations out there to support uh, people with special needs, and there's more services added all the time. Um, and like you said, there's government resources, um, there are private resources, people who can help. Um, so once again, it's just a matter of connecting and, and finding those resources. Right. And one of the questions asked if there are resources for single parents with their own mental health issues or disabilities. Do you know any off the top of your head? Uh, off, the, off the top of my head, no, but I would say we can find it. Like that's okay. one of the things that Craig mentioned. Like, we, you know, we, we'll find the organization or we'll find the connection for that because that's what mm -hmm. we do. Yeah, and the final question asks like, how severe does a disability have to be to qualify for assistance? And I think like you said, it depends on the program and maybe if they had specific questions, they could discuss this with a consultation with either of you. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it really depends on, on the diagnoses. 
and what it is. But if it's a qualifying diagnosis, then they're going to they'll be qualified for for any of the programs ultimately. Yeah, and that's a big part of it is getting a diagnosis in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. Very important. You know, without the diagnosis, you don't really get a lot of services, and right. that includes even education at school. All right, well, those are all of the audience questions. Um, this was such an informative and comprehensive presentation. And if you wanna just speak again about the complimentary consultation, how they can reach you. I know a few people have said yes in the chat that they would like a complimentary consultation with you. So we'll be sure to give you that information. Yeah, and so what'll happen is, uh, you know, the, Sarah will reach out to us and we'll reach out to all of you. But, but generally the idea is we know that sometimes it's, it's every, you know, it gets a little hectic and a little crazy. And especially if you're in a webinar, it's tough to be asking those questions and, and really finding something that, that's specific to you. So that's why Craig and I do it. We make it available so that we can have that conversation to really understand what it is you're trying to do and how we can be that, that support and help you go through that. Um, that's the reason that we do it. That's the reason we put it in place is to make sure that you you're, you're at least getting the direction. We probably won't have the answer because God bless, we're gonna live, you know, in terms of dealing with everything. But we can certainly help you and sort of, you know, guide you through that and to say, look, here, we know this group, we know that organization or this, as Craig mentioned, this foundation or this community support group, you can go talk to them or they'll have access to you. Awesome, well, thank you both so much for this presentation. If anyone is interested in the consultation, you can, um, note that in our post webinar survey by including your email so that we can reach out to you and put you in touch with the Aries Foundation. Um, but thank you everyone for attending. Craig, Tom, it was wonderful. And we're looking forward to our next presentation with you both. Appreciate it, Tara. Hey, everybody, have a great rest of the day. And thank you, Hal, for making us sound and look so good. <laughs> yes, thank you, Hal. Take care, everyone. Have a good one. Okay.